Well hello and welcome to the service from Broadway Baptist Church but actually filmed in the manse. My name's Rochelle, I'm the minister and this is my second Sunday in isolation, hence the home setting. Well it is the fourth Sunday in Advent and our time of waiting is nearly over. And through Advent, as a church, we've used daily readings from the Jesse Tree tradition that covers the whole story of God's love and faithfulness displayed from creation to cradle. And on the Sundays, we've explored the peace promised from the stump of Jesse, as spoken about in Isaiah. The hope of the covenant promises of blessing given to Abraham. The steadfast love expressed in calling David to be the shepherd king and the renewal of the covenant. And today we light the candle of joy as those covenant blessings come to fulfilment in the promise to Mary that she is going to have a baby and she is to call him Jesus. And she, in turn, bursts out in praise when she meets her cousin Elizabeth, as we will hear about later. Well, these are uncertain times, and perhaps you are wondering about your Christmas plans. Perhaps you have loved ones with Covid or other sickness, or you have other concerns. The light shines brightest in the darkest times. And as I have read these passages through December, it is a reminder once again of God's presence in the midst of troubled times, amongst people who wander away, who mess up, but he continues to work out his promises. And that helps me to look forward with hope and joy. It helps me to adjust my perspective from being consumed by the present to it being framed by Jesus who has come who is here and who will come again. Let's pray. Lord, as we look back in the ways in which you have worked out your plans through history, we are in awe of your love that never wavers. It shines through in unexpected places and through unexpected people. And that gives us hope. It brings us peace. Thank you, God, for the joy you give us. And we ask that as we wait for all your promises to be fulfilled and for Christ to come again, that you would remain present with us. Help us today and every day to worship you, to hear your word and to do your will by sharing your joy with each other. We ask it in the name of the one who was born in Bethlehem. Amen. Join with me as we sing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her Thank you. 
Let us give thanks and praise to God. God our Creator, you came among us in Jesus full of grace and truth. You came to lead us from darkness into the light of your love through the shedding of Jesus' blood. In him has dawned resurrection life. How great is our God! Faced with the clamour and corruption of the world. We trust your promise to renew the earth, to end tears and troubles, and to establish your kingdom of goodness and love. How great is our God! We praise you for signs of your blessing among us today, for your presence with your people, for healing lives that are torn or broken fulfilling believers with love and hope. How great is our God! Our Lord is the God who rescues from death, who gives light and joy to his people, who strengthens the weak and heals the suffering. Come, Lord Jesus, and rule the earth. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory for ever and ever amen let us pray as we pray for god's world we give thanks that with modern technology, we can be aware of the joys and sorrows of people all over the world. So we give thanks for the journalists who take huge risks and go into dangerous places to bring us a picture of what is really happening, the good things and the truly awful. We pray today for the large number of journalists currently in prison because they are sending out information that countries wish to keep hidden. And for the families of at least 24 journalists who have been killed this year for their work. Through journalists, we first heard this year of what was happening in Afghanistan as the Taliban retook control. But we have a closer link 
as BMS World Mission has been active there for some years. And so one of the BMS workers who has had to leave his project asks us to pray for the country. We pray, Lord, for peace and a process of justice and reconciliation. And as he asks us for, to pray for the rain and snow to come at the right time so that crops may grow to alleviate the desperate famine they are currently experiencing. We pray too that the Taliban may allow the aid agencies to bring relief. As we pray for our country, picture those long lines waiting for their injections. Father, we do give thanks for the work of the NHS. Lord, give each worker strength and health to play their part. Give wisdom to those running care homes and other places looking after those who are vulnerable to get the right balance between safety and our need to be with those we love. And we pray for our church. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for all those who came to the Christingle last week and pray that adults and children alike may have glimpsed the wonder of your love taking flesh in the baby Jesus and want to find more. Give us all the words we need as we send cards out and meet with our friends so that even through us, people may see your light that shines in the darkness. We pray for any who are unable to meet with their loved ones over Christmas and any who live alone and find Christmas Day very difficult. Show us, Lord, what we can do. Let's take a moment in the silence to carry to God those for whom we are concerned. And be with us, we pray, Lord Jesus. Bring us to the wonder of the manger. We ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who left the splendour of heaven to come and show us your love. Amen.
Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who, who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she, who was said to be unable to conceive, is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. But which Mary is that? Could it be the Mary of the New Testament? The Mary of Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, is in her teens living in a village. Of course, she's unique, just like everyone else. But judging from appearances, she's unlikely to change the world until the day God appears in the form of an angel. The angel says Mary will be the mother of God's son. And Mary responds by composing a song. My soul magnifies the Lord. In this song, Mary speaks of God scattering the proud, bringing down rulers, sending the rich away with nothing. And that isn't what society expect. It's a contrary point of view. And seeing that's what Mary believes, does she do anything about it? Indeed, if you and I believe in an end to oppression, what do we do about that? Many Christians see wrong in the world and wish to defeat it. Personally, I quite fancy myself as a slayer of dragons. I find the image of St George and the dragon appealing. It would be a great thing to conquer some evil, to act in ways that keep people safe and help them flourish. History shows us some great Christian contrarians. Martin Luther, William Wilberforce, Martin Luther King. Such people take risks. They go against social convention or popular opinion to promote their causes. Often they're not very agreeable people. They don't always manage relationships well but they stick to their guns and some have a huge effect. Of course, there's a danger. Some of us know we'll never slay a dragon and we settle instead for slaying gnats. But is slaying gnats worthwhile given the collateral damage we may cause in the process? In principle, dragon slaying is of huge value. William Wilberforce wore himself out in the anti-slavery cause, and he achieved a great good. And when we learn about such people, there's an implicit question. What can we do to follow in their footsteps? 
Coming back to Mary, what Mary looks for in her song is for the humble to be raised, the hungry filled, and God's people blessed with mercy. She knows prosperity, power and property aren't what really matters in life. People who imagine success and riches are everything tread down the weak and the poor to get what they want. They use power wrongly and become oppressive. Through being careless of others, they increase injustice. But the kingdom of God has contrary priorities. God scatters the wicked. God raises up the humble and good. So what part does Mary play in this? And what can you and I do? The key to Mary's song are the words... My spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. The Magnificat is not about what Mary can do or you and I can do. It's about what God will do. God has done great things for Mary, making her the mother of his son. And in effect, God's already done everything necessary to right the wrongs of this world. The Magnificat focuses wholly on God and God's great deeds. The birth of Jesus means healing for the world. And though Jesus isn't yet born, Mary is so certain of God's future kingdom, she speaks of it as already present. Certainly, the kingdom is present in the person of the baby within her. But Mary goes further. God has lifted up the humble. God has filled the hungry with good things. Many modern Christians can't get their heads round this kind of certainty. Though it's not arrogant, is it? Mary's certainty isn't based on any imagined strength in herself. It's based entirely on faith in God's love, faith in God's desire and ability to rescue humanity. And when we consider the greatness of God, the question of what Mary can do or what you and I can do seems insignificant. As we know, Christianity in Europe and North America is in the wilderness. Many reject the church or believe it has nothing worth saying. A local church may do relatively well, but the bigger picture is grim. Naturally, we want the best for God's church. We may feel we must do something or we may feel weary and defeated. And at this point especially, Mary's perspective is worth considering. This world of ours is hugely complex. It includes many natural and social systems, all of which influence each other. Governments put measures in place to solve one issue, only to find problems emerging elsewhere. And yet we humans persist in believing we can put the world right. And to some degree, we need to believe this. Humanity needs to be active for good in the world. But humility is also vital. And the quality of Mary's trust in God makes the point. Instead of saying, I know best, we say, God knows best. So I'll pray for God's wisdom. Instead of saying, success in this project is all down to me, we say, God is gracious. God will lead and resources. God will help us promote his kingdom, even when we don't understand what God's doing. When the angel tells Mary she'll be the mother of God's son, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me according to your word. Mary accepts the future God's leading her into. I guess she knows it won't be easy. In the short term, having a baby outside marriage makes her vulnerable to misunderstanding. And then after Jesus is born, an elderly man in the temple prophesies pain for Mary. A sword 
will pierce your soul. Of course, Mary knew joy as well. And inevitably, she had plenty of work caring for Jesus. Mary accepts all this, the sorrows, the joys, the dull routines. She doesn't struggle against God's call. It's all part of her humility, her willingness to do as God asks. But more than that, Mary sees herself as blessed by God in the call he gives. The mighty one has done great things for me. She doesn't merely accept the role God gives her. She's grateful for it. She sees it as a blessing. If you and I were Jews in first century Palestine, we'd be looking for God's promises in scripture to be fulfilled. God promised Abraham that through his offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. God promised David, one of his descendants will establish justice and peace and reign forever. And this is God's promise to Mary. God will give Mary's son the throne of his father David. Jesus will be a blessing to all peoples. And of course, this is the meaning for Mary. Indeed, it's the meaning of Christmas. Through the baby born of Mary, God comes quietly into his world. He comes in the power of wisdom and love to do a great thing for humanity, to bring healing and new life to the world. The signs are all there in Jesus' ministry. God can overcome the sorrows of this world. God can bring justice and peace. God's actions in Jesus point to this. God's goodness and love will rule forever. This is what God will accomplish through Mary's son. And any part you and I have in this victory is entirely secondary. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, a pregnant woman cries out in pain as she's about to give birth. And then a great dragon appears in the heavens. The dragon stands in front of the woman with the aim of devouring her child. But when Jesus is born, God acts to protect him. The woman doesn't try to slay the dragon. She flees into the wilderness where God brings her through her troubles. The dragon is slain not by Mary nor by any human but by Michael and his angels. You and I can't achieve victory over evil. We may experience struggles with evil, but it's beyond our ability to conquer. The coming of God's kingdom is the work of God and his son, Jesus Christ, even though you and I have parts to play, as indeed did Mary. In the Magnificat, Mary refuses to accept the conventions of power and wealth. Oppression is neither right nor inevitable. In that sense, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, could fit her character. But what Mary's really doing in her song is lining herself up with God's priorities. Mary couldn't defeat the dragons in her society. And she didn't join the zealots who launched occasional raids against the Roman occupation of Palestine. In terms of what's right and good, Mary knew which side she was on. But it doesn't seem likely she was politically involved. Rather, she looked to God as saviour. And that stopped her being fatalistic. Mary's hope was strong. In our culture, we invite people to be active in the cause of good and right. Passivity doesn't impress us. Society would like us to ask, what can I do? And that has its place. We need people to be active in good causes, whether for the church or the wider community. And it's certainly unfair to see Mary as passive. 
What Mary highlights for us is a basic attitude to life, a wisdom that's fundamental. God gave a calling to many biblical characters and for each individual that calling worked itself out in different ways. We're not all called to be like Mary, except at a basic level that applies to every believer. Like Mary, you and I have limitations. We can't slay all the dragons, but that's no reason for despair. Things impossible for us to do, God has promised to do. We can't create in the world, or even in Derby, the quality of justice and love we see in Jesus. We can't renew our nation in goodness and harmony. We can't find a solution to every disease and trouble. But God can save the world and will save it. If we dare to believe in God as Saviour, if we have Mary's hope, we will not be passive. Faith in God's salvation transforms our attitude to life. We'll cast aside despair and cynicism. We'll give ourselves to the Saviour God who Jesus reveals. And then we'll share something of the love and blessing God's given to us leaving the slaying of dragons to God and his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, William, for this hope-filled message. Mary's song of praise and this aspect of the nativity story is often overlooked, but it is the link between the baby born vulnerable and totally dependent who grows up to invite us to bring all our vulnerabilities to him and experience new life for ourselves. So let's join with singing this song, Tell Out My Soul. <laughs> from this act of worship has touched you particularly and you would like someone to talk with or pray with please get in touch via our Facebook page or website and if you are watching this the week before Christmas we do have other events happening all of them of course taking into account social distancing ventilation all of those things but do check our Facebook page or website for any last minute changes that might be necessary as we close this act of worship, be strong.
do not fear. The Lord will come. May Christ, born of Mary, strengthen your faith, show you the path from darkness to light, and give you grace to welcome God's kingdom, joyful in hope and constant in love. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be yours for evermore. Amen. God bless. Lift up your eyes and look for him. Jesus, the coming Savior King, born to redeem the world from sin, bringing his peace to all. Now, if you walk in darkest night, look for his dawn that's breaking bright. Nothing shall ever stop this light Bringing new hope to all Oh, lift up your eyes, see the King Worship the Savior, come praise Him Jesus the Lord of i